So before we looked at how to make a simple horn out of sheet metal, but the horn, what's the range of the directivities we can get out of a horn antenna? Uh, just a bare waveguide end, this is about 7 dBi. We already had this the first hour here on the table. If we build a, a longer horn, we are severely limited with the phase error. So for larger directivities, larger gains, we get to very long horns. And usually if we build just a horn antenna, so just a simple horn, and we are length limited with this horn, we are not going to make a 40 meter long antenna for satellite TV, certainly not that. Uh, in order to control this, now here we have straight wave fronts, this wave fronts now starts opening, start opening here. To control the phase error, we have to work on the length of this horn. And uh, one see very simple expression is that if we have want to keep this length manageable, so length uh, say uh, smaller than three times the aperture here, so three times the height here. If we want our height or width, whatever we have, we come out that the directivity of this will be smaller or equal to 25 dBi. And in fact, it's very difficult to get horns over 25 dBi <coughs> uh, with this design. So no correction of the phase error on our surface here. This horn is about 22, 23 dBi. That's the range of directivity of this horn here. <coughs> so to say. But <coughs> we can do better by correcting the wave fronts. How do we correct the, the wave fronts? With a converging lens. A converging dielectric lens like on this horn here. If you look at the data of this horn, this horn has 150 millimeters length, 15 centimeters length, for a directivity of 34 dBi at quite five high frequencies. This waveguide flange is for the range 26 to 40 gigahertz. So it's very, very small waveguide here. Very small. Of course, the polarization is up because the polarization of the main mode in the waveguide is in direction. And here we have a lens. So let me let me draw this horn. So in order to correct uh, the square phase error on this horn, uh, so I have straight wave fronts in the waveguide, but this fronts wave fronts start opening. Uh, out a spherical wave fronts here, but then I insert a lens here, a dielectric lens in front of my horn, which is made from some dielectric that has uh, its dielectric constant uh, relative permittivity larger than one. What happens after the lens if I manage to put the focal of my lens? in the throat of the horn. So I have, I have the focal of my lens in the throat of my horn. I will transform uh, spherical wave fronts into parallel plane wave fronts. And this way I can correct the error. On this lens I could also do something else. You can see it on the sample I sent you around. Uh, that this lens actually does not have only such a spherical shape of the electric, but uh, uh, on any dielectric I have considerable reflection because the electric is a di different media than air. So I actually get, make small grooves here, small compared to the wavelength, and also small grooves on the other side of the lens, and this is actually my anti-reflection coating. The same as in optical lenses, but anti-reflection coating in optical lenses, I usually use magnesium fluoride, deposit magnesium, a th very thin layer, lambda quarter thin layer 
of uh, magnesium fluoride on glass lenses. While here I can, I do not have the material, I do not have the plastic with the right uh, uh, the electric permittivity, but I, what I do have, I can manage the shape of this plastic. And that's the reason why I, I make here on this antenna, uh, you see that th here are grooves, are concentric grooves, and these concentric grooves are much smaller than wavelength, so they act as an average dielectric uh, to provide the anti-reflection coating to this lens. Well, not all lenses need to be this shape. Sometimes lenses are made in a different way. So this is also a lens antenna. It's a rectangular waveguide uh, transforming into a circular waveguide. And then I have a dielectric lens here. So also this dielectric lens m changes the performance of this antenna. So lenses may be also of other shapes. Uh, say, uh, in order to achieve the same effect, I may have my waveguide here. And in my waveguide, I insert a piece of dielectric. So I insert here a dielectric rod, rod with an the uh, permittivity, relative permittivity larger than one. What does this rod do? If I get here with a plane wave, wave fronts, say, uh, receiving this antenna, this wave fronts coming in this direction. The wave front is, uh, the, the electric is delaying the wave fronts that go through it. And it's slowly shaping this beam to focus on the waveguide. Because this is much smaller, this uh, lambda prime, is much smaller than lambda zero in free space. And if I put a, such a uh, rod lens in the, in the throat of my antenna, I also can also make a directional antenna. I get the same effect as with the more conventional shape of lenses as we have here. But I can use this shape of lens also at very small wavelengths in the optical range. Well, this only works when this rod is approximately the size of, uh, of the wavelength. Then it works. Now, uh, I could build antennas like this, the one that went around. Uh, where is it right now? OK. What is the device inside that antenna? The device you see through the waveguide here. What is this thing you see in here? It's a piece of dielectric at this angle, at 45 degrees with respect to the polarization. So this will delay this polarization and will not affect this polarization. So this is, this will be without delay, this will be with delay. This is going to rotate circularly. So this is going to the right hand. So this device inside here transforms linear polarization in a circular waveguide into uh, circular polarization in a circular waveguide. Now uh, that antenna is for about three centimeters wavelength. Uh, the problem even with the rod lenses or such uh, bulk dielectric lenses like we saw here is that we need lots of material, especially if we go to longer wavelengths. Because as long as there are centimeters of wavelengths, then we can do this out of plastic. But if these are meters of wavelength, uh, we need tons of plastic. And that doesn't work out. So uh, the thing we have to discuss today is how to replace the dielectric. So if I draw here a capacitor, capacitor has two plates, two plates, uh, and in this capacitor, I put a piece of dielectric, a piece of dielectric that has some permittivity larger than one. And now the electric displacement here, uh, is equal to the uh, permittivity of free space times relative permittivity times electric field. How to get a larger field without using dielectrics? Because dielectrics, uh, as, as I said, if there are, uh, these are meters of dimensions, these are tons of plastic to be used for our antenna, and tons of plastic is way too expensive, way too heavy. What trick could we use? 
And now it's an issue of tricks here. And uh, this issue of tricks, how does it go? First, I could shorten the field lines. The field lines are this direction here. How to shorten the field lines? I could replace my dielectric with chunks of metal, say like metal balls here. Balls made of metal, so no longer the electric, but balls, so uh, metal. With metal, my field lines become shorter. If the field lines are shorter, the electric field density, the displacement field is larger, becomes larger. So uh, these chunks of metal have exactly the same effect in the capacitor uh, as, as a natu natural dielectric. Then, uh, if I think about electric field, do I really need mass of metal here? No. Holes can be ho uh, balls can be hollow. If the balls are hollow, I can just use balloons here, met metalized balloons here. And I save lots of material here. So just hollow balloons. Again, the same capacitor. And also here, the electric field lies shortened. But there is, that's still much material. I could do better than that. And the, the other trick is to use rods. Because I know the direction of the field. I know this direction. If I know the direction, it doesn't make sense to make anything perpendicular to this direction, anything orthogonal to this direction. Only rods in the direction of the field will have some effect. So the trick is now to have a capacitor. with just some metal rods that have just one dimension. Um, full metal balls have uh, uh, three dimensions. Uh, balloons have two dimensions. Rods have just one dimension. So maximum saving of the material. And yet, the uh, field lines here get shorter. Or this field line here gets shorter. This, or this field line here gets shortened due to the rod presence of power. And there is yet another trick I can do to make an artificial dielectric. Use resonances. Use resonances in the near field of the rods. So this is my capacitor. I will only draw one rod because, because I don't have the space to draw uh, many rods here. Uh, I only have one rod. So now this rod, being metal, has some inductivity in the near field. In the near field, I can talk about the inductivity. And has uh, its own capacitance between the ends of the rod and has capacitance to the end plates. OK? If I draw just another rod because I have the time right now. Another rod, yet also this one has an inductivity, has its own capacitance between the ends of the road, road and has some capacitance here to the one plate and to the other plate. And if I use a resonance effect, I can obtain even more, uh, more um, a larger effect with a smaller quantity of metals. If I now uh, draw the admittance of such a circuit, oh. so this is frequency, say omega, this is admittance y. For 
for uh, a simple capacitor, like uh, metal balls, hollow balls, or rods without the resonance, this is just a straight line. Uh, this is just J omega C. I draw the, the absolute value to avoid messing with complex number, just the value of the admittance, what I can do here. But if I use resonances, this thing first comes to a serious resonance and then to a parallel resonance. So, so the admittance with the uh, with, uh, first, it's pretty parallel. Then this thing grows, comes to a pole, goes to infinity, and then comes back from the other side. So this should not be absolute value of y, but uh, 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 imaginary, part, imaginary part of y, because I'm interested in the reactive components here. So at some particular length, I can have a very well, uh, large effect here, so permittivity larger than 1. But I can also have at other frequencies effects like permittivity smaller than 1. So I have many different tricks I can make here, using also the resonance effect and using just rods. And this is now the idea of my antenna. I start with a half-wave dipole. Halfway with dipole, with a generator in between, and this is lambda half. And this is the fed element. Then I need such a dielectric road to make a directional antenna. Uh, to make such a directional antenna, I need somewhat shorter rods, but carefully chosen, chosen, carefully chosen their lengths. And with these rods here, I make an artificial dielectric. So these rods, this is lambda half, these rods may be uh, 0.45 lambda, just to give you an idea how long they are. And these rods, what do these rods do? These rods create here an artificial dielectric. Larger than one. And uh, uh, this is a converging lens. And on the other side, I could do the opposite. I don't want radiation on the back. So I put here an even longer rod. I put here a longer rod. That's perhaps maybe 0 0.55 lambda. And this longer rod now creates, we are in this point here right now. Uh, uh, relative uh, permittivity smaller than 1. So this thing here actually now behaves as a diverging lens. If I draw this with the, the symbol of lenses. So diverging lens here, converging lens here. And this way I can build a directional antenna. This is something really new with radio antennas because if you look at the evolution of radio antennas. Heinrich Hertz was using optical antennas, was using converging mirrors, was using converging lenses made of, out of dielectric. Uh, other people like Nikola Tesla even didn't understand what the directivity is. Marconi found out, Guglielmo Marconi found out that there are some directivity, uh, per, uh, directivity the antennas have some directivity performance, but he didn't understand this. It was uh, <coughs> it was a uh, beverage that uh, 20 years after Marconi discovered how this long wire antenna works. But here we come to the point where people start thinking, and interestingly, they start thinking in Japan. 926, it was Shintaro Uda in Japan. And this is finally something really new about antennas. Building antennas out of artificial dielectrics. We, it's very difficult to do this with optical frequency. We would need very small photolithography to make such small elements uh, in optics. But in radio, this is quite a practical 
solution. Uh, Shintaro Uda only published his research in Japanese and not really many people are able to read Japanese so this thing was, uh, was a little bit forgotten. So uh, in 1928 his supervisor Hidetsugu Yagi finally, pub finally published, he was the supervisor of Uda but uh, Hidetsugu Yagi published the result of all the experiments they were doing. They were bringing transmitters, receivers and antennas. And uh, Uda was, uh, uh, was designing the antennas. And Hidetsugu Yagi published this thing finally in English in the United States. And that's the reason why this antenna today is known as the Yagi antenna. Or maybe Yagi Uda antenna. Unfortunately, uh, Unfortunately, no one knows about the original inventor of this, uh, uh, this antenna. Although Yagi in his paper claimed explicitly that Uda is the inventor. He was correct, he was honest. He was an honest professor. He said, my uh, assistant Uda invented this antenna. That's what uh, Yagi said. Uh, so the antenna now is mainly known as the Yagi antenna. Americans don't like this, this thing either, so uh, in the times between the two, two world wars, all big nations were superpowers and this antenna found an immediate use in the first raiders. So Americans built raiders, the British built raiders using such antenna. Even in the Soviet Union they built raiders with such antennas. And they didn't want to tell the Japanese invented this because Japanese were, the Japanese were their, their enemies in the, the Second World War. So they simply called this antenna a beam antenna. Now you can imagine why it was called a beam antenna. And it's still called by American radio amateurs, it's still called the beam antenna. So it's still, we are still there. They still, they, they, they don't want, don't want, Americans don't want to accept that the Japanese invented actually this antenna. But this was one major breakthrough in the antennas. Finally something new in radio. Finally something we, we first thought about the problem and then trying to find the solution with the smallest amount of material. These metal rods really represent a very small fraction of the volume of this antenna. So this can be very cheap to manufacture, very efficient. Unfortunately, as you see here, this antenna is very narrow band. If we try to use this good, re good resonance region here, we are very narrow band. This bandwidth is usually less than 10% of the central frequency. Uh, Yagi, ante Yagi Uda antenna are usually very, very narrow band. There are other possibilities to make uh, equivalent structures. So this is called really a slow wave structure. Uh, considering the equivalent with the dielectric antenna, you saw that the electric antenna went, went around the, the class. Uh, so it's the equivalent of the dielectric antenna is a slow wave structure made out of metal, made out of rods. There is a number of ways we can make this sol slow wave structures. Uh, also for the original Yagi antenna, I brought here a Chinese example the AliExpress Wi-Fi antenna. Uh, I only know about this antenna that it doesn't work. I measured it several times in several possibilities. So this should be an antenna for 2.4 gigahertz. At 2.4 gigahertz it has the minimum of gain. It's real shit this. Uh, this is AliExpress shit. But it works fine at 2.6 gigahertz. It's just designed in the wrong way. So. Uh, Designing such a thing like such an antenna, uh, we have uh, several options. Now one is to use the National Bureau of Standard tables. These are very, known, very well known tables. I will send you a copy via email of these tables uh, just to see where to start the design antenna from. And then we have computer simulation. 
electromagnetic If you don't want to do just measurements, but uh, first you do some simulation and then you come hopefully to a reasonable result, then you measure your result actually to find out. Here, uh, uh, the dimensions of this antenna, are, this antenna are wrong. That's the problem with the Chinese. This works at 2.6 gigahertz. And in fact, because of this narrow bandwidth here, uh, if I plot the directivity, in dBi versus the frequency, uh, the Yagi antenna has typically such a graph. Uh, a slow increase and a very steep uh, decrease down from the design frequency of zero. And this bandwidth perhaps is around 10% of F0. Uh, because we are, go we are using the resonance effects in the rods. So now what the Chinese antenna does, uh, the Chinese antenna has this maximum at 2.6 gigahertz. And I don't know how the Chinese managed to get a narrow dip here around 2.4 gigahertz. Mm, they must have had a really unfortunate day while designing this antenna. So this, this antenna doesn't work. Don't buy this on, on uh, AliExpress. This is, uh, this, is really shit. this is really shit. Don't buy this. But uh, we can do better using other things, other solutions. So this antenna looks, uh, at first glance, looks exactly what we have here on the table at first glance. But uh, it has a number of mistakes, so the size is wrong. There is no balancing circuit. There is no balloon to fit this folded dipole here. Uh, there's also a screw making a short inside here, but I shortened the screws just, just to have it operating to be able to measure. It's made for the wrong frequency. So uh, with uh, Yagi antennas, uh, you cannot design from scratch. You have to make... Uh, and use some good tables, like NBS tables, make some good computer simulations, account for every detail you have in the antenna. Uh, for instance, if uh, the, the rods go to a metal boom, a round metal boom, that has the diameter 2A, uh, these uh, elements, L prime, have to be made a little bit sh longer. L prime is around the calculated length n plus two thirds of the diameter. And if the boom is was square, if you have a square boom with the side a, uh, then L prime is approximately L plus three quarters of the side of this square boom. So you have to make corrections also for the carrier of these elements. And probably the Chinese made no correction here. They don't know how to do it. But uh, this correction is uh, w very well described in the National Bureau of Standards tables to design Yagi Wood antennas. Uh, then uh, the problem is now we have rods. These rods only work for a single polarization in the direction of the rods. If you want to make both polarizations, we have to use crosses across the Yagi antenna. Across the Yagi antenna. So I'm not very good at drawing today. We can have at maximum two orthogonal polarization. We put rods in the direction of each polarization, and that's the solution. Also, for circular polarization, this would work. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, other solutions to do. One is to make such a structure using loops. Loops, circular loops. Also make a slow wave structure. 
where the circumference of the loop to make a dielectric, so this circumference should be approximately 0.09 lambda. So almost the same, uh, almost the same ratio as here. Uh, where is the problem with the loops? The problem with the loops is holding them somewhere in place. With uh, crosses, I can put the boom here on the axis of the crosses, and the boom does not affect the electric field. But here, if I here put a metal structure, a metal carrier boom here, this boom, uh, this is now used for, uh, for vertical polarization only. Polarization only. Because this boom affects the field. Otherwise, uh, circular loops could be used for any polarization. But if I put the boom, then the boom affects the field. I have, uh, there are better solutions to do this. Same thing. So, there are this possibility to put disks. Disks cut out of metal sheet. And I could put disc, discs in the center of a, uh, of a metal boom. I can put a metal boom here in the center, going here. So after, behind this disc, now going up here. Behind this disc, going out here. Behind this disc. Oh no, so, so, so it's okay. Behind the disc. I can proceed with the boom here, and I can proceed with the boom here. So if I put the boom in the center, I do not affect any polarization of the field. And this is the solution to make an antenna using disks. Disks are very broadband. Why? Disks resemble not rods, but uh, not really spheres, but uh, Something in between, something that has a much broader resonance effect to, uh, with respect to, much broader resonance with respect to, to the rods. So this may be a very broad antenna, which, which is good. Not that we need such a broad antenna, but we usually do the calculations wrong, like the Chinese here. Here the Chinese did the calculation wrong. So here, even if you screw up with the calculation, you, you still get a working antenna. And further, the feeding of this antenna is very simple. If you look here at the connector, this is a 50 ohm connector. You just feed one of the elements here with this connector. You just feed one of the elements. And you can adjust the magnitude of the impedance with the offset of this connector. So this eccentricity of the connector uh, sets the magnitude of the impedance. And you can adjust the frequency of the impedance matching with the diameter of this disk. So you can do everything by changing simple physical parameters of this antenna. There is nothing difficult to do it. This antenna was invented in 1953 by two Frenchmen, Simon and Weil, in Paris. Because they wrote the article in French, Americans do not know this. They do not know that this exists. Because Americans are unable to read French. So this does not exist in uh, the United States, but exists in Russia. In Soviet Union, Soviet Union already used this kind of antenna on their space probes, on their satellites, back in 1970. So, so it's because it's a very good antenna. And this is also built for the Wi-Fi frequency band. It can be simply made at home. This is uh, actually for 2.4 gigahertz. So uh, the rods here are, the disks should be, the diameter of the disks should be approximately uh, 0.3 lambda. 0.3 lambda, which gives a circumference about one wavelength. The circumference of the disk should be about one wavelength. So this is the trick, how to do these things. Uh, uh, this antenna now is built, uh, frequently built by Wi-Fi enthusiasts. 
because it's very simple to build. There are no difficult components. There is no Chinese balloon that does not work in between. So there are no, no difficult things to do. And it's easy to reproduce at home. And this is something I propose to you for your student project if you want to build an antenna. Find a project on the internet, try to build it, try to measure it in our lab. It's not necessary to make it such long as that one here. I sent it But this is quite, a, quite a, an interesting antenna. And there is yet another, so this was 1953, 1953, Simon and Ver, in French, in France. And there's yet another idea to make a directional antenna using a helical wire. A helix also acts as a slow wave structure if the circumference of the individual the circumference of the individual turns of this helix is about one wavelength and if the pitch of the helix is between 0.2 to 0.25 wavelengths. Uh, this was invented by John Krauss. This is an American John Crow in 1946. So uh, John Krauss has his famous books on, book on antennas. That book is even useful for you as to study today. Though the book is old, I think it uh, had more than 10 reprints, these books, and the last reprints were, were already published after, uh, after the author has died. But it's a very popular book on antennas, so something very useful. So how is a helical antenna built? This is an example of a helix. This helix is for 1.7 gigahertz, so around 18 centimeters wavelength. So 18 centimeters is the length of one turn. And this is about a quarter wavelength spacing between the turns. Uh, you see it's simply helix against the reflector. And uh, since the helix itself ends up with about 140 ohms of radiation resistance. This is lowered down to 50 ohms by this circuit here, this additional variable capacitor, this plate of brass here, and this length of line here. So this is, this is the impedance matching of this helix. So the helix antenna, the, this is an end fire helix. Uh, what? I'm looking where I, where I have still some place on the board. Here. So the end fire helix antenna, you have a circular reflector, and you put your generator in between here. Your generator, and here you have this helix. And uh, if you want to do some impedance matching, for impedance matching you can put an adjustable capacitor over here. After a certain length of wire, you put here an adjustable capacitor to wire ground. But maybe it's not easy to draw everything on this board because of the thickness of the. Of the so putting a capacitor after a short length of helix, putting a capacitor to wire ground. And you have to adjust this capacitor for the best impedance matching. That's the trick to do the impedance matching. Well, here with the disks, with the disk, I, if I draw a side view of such a disk antenna, you have one large disk reflector, the same as this one here in the Yagi antenna. You have the fat disk, and then you have smaller disks. So the, this is put on. Boom, now you have this part here is our artificial dielectric. This is the reflector that has a lower one. And uh, there's yet another disk usually used for impedance matching. And you put the uh, coaxial line in here. So here is the coaxial cable and the center wire, the center wire going to this disk here. 
And by playing with the diameter of the disc, the disc, disc and the eccentricity of the fit point, you can also obtain a perfect impedance match here. Plus playing with this closed disc here, the first disc also has much uh, influence to the impedance. So, so you can uh, work out the impedance of the antenna you're building. So, uh, what is the problem of the helix? It needs an insulating support. So we cannot use metal supports here. We have to have an insulating. This is PVC material just to support this helical, helical tape here. Well, uh, the, the disc antenna, the disc antenna can be made completely out of metal. Something I should warn you about uh, internet sites. Many designers build this antenna simply out of using a threaded bar and putting nuts for all the single elements. That's not correct. Uh, in this antenna, you have very large currents, not just in the discs, but also in the boom in the carrier. There's a large field around here, so there are large currents in the boom. And that's the reason why, you put, why I put a threaded rod made of stainless steel because of its strength in the center. And I put here spacers made out of aluminum tube because aluminum is a very good electrical conductor, not to having losses. So the whole uh, stainless steel is very, very lossy material for radio frequency. While aluminum it is not. So this is covered with aluminum here. And these spacers with aluminum also define the spacing of the individual uh, elements here. So this is how to how to design this antenna. There, there are reasons why. For instance, the Chinese were very bad in this antenna. The Chinese, some of these rods actually move. If these rods move, this one particularly moves. If this rod moves, it's, it means that this rod has a very poor electrical contact with the boom. If you have a poor electrical contact with the boom, the frequency is going to shift. And that's the problem of this antenna. Poor mechanical design. Poor Chinese mechanical design. So that, that's the main problem of this antenna. Not really that it's off frequency, but it's also a very poor design. Well, you can do everything here with a threaded rod and some pressure, tightening the nuts, and here you have a very good electrical contact. Aluminum to aluminum, aluminum spacers to aluminum elements, aluminum spacer to aluminum elements. So you have a very, very good electrical contact and everything pressed with these two nuts. So uh, this is a good design. This is a Russian design, actually. Uh, why is the Russian design? Uh, in Russia, they use these antennas not for Wi-Fi, also for Wi-Fi, but they use them for LTE access. Uh, you may think, oh, okay, LTE has very strong signals uh, everywhere here in Slovenia. But in Slovenia, distances are short, and LTE base stations is just a few hundred meters away here. But in Russia, distances are a little bit longer. Russia is very sparsely populated, and that's the reason why they need the directional antennas to have internet access. And that's the reason why I, they, they are building these antennas. <coughs> that's the reason why design, the design comes from, from, from Russia for this antenna. But it's a very good antenna. This one measurement, the measure directivity on this one in the Wi Fi band, band is 17.5 dB. This is, a, is an excellent gain, gain for the size of this antenna. Uh, standard uh, Yagi Uda cannot do that, of the same length, of the same carrier length. So this is a particularly good antenna. So I hope we said everything for today. Did I forget something? Okay, yes, I forgot something. Uh, there are also other slow wave structures you may see. Uh, these slow wave structures may not be just one dimensional. They may have two or three dimensions. I forgot to tell you that this. So slow wave structures may be also built like this. I will show you here. You have one fed element. You may have more reflectors on the back. These are reflectors with uh, uh, relative permittivity less than one. And in the front, uh, so this is also one carrier, there is a boom here, but there goes uh, many booms here. 
And on these many booms, on each boom, you have its own directors, its own artificial dielectric. So you have, you here you may have a slow wave structure. This is uh, also a 2D or 3D slow wave structure. This is also used with antennas. Just, just to tell you that this is not the only solution to do it. This is the cheapest solution to do it. But for broadband antennas, rods are not the best thing to do. Uh, so they need to put rods in on more than one boom, and all this now acts as a as an artificial dielectric. All this is now our lens in front of the antenna. So all this here is uh, permittivity larger than one, and all this makes the lens. It can be done, but it's it's not that efficient. These things can do more. This thing can, this thing can, does more than that. But people don't understand this thing. So we build, build such antennas, and you can see on the roofs many of such antennas. But they could actually obtain more from, from this antenna here. Remember that the Russian guns are efficient. And this is, in fact, this antenna is called the Russian gun. So that's all about antennas today. Next time, we should see how to correct uh, spherical wave fronts in a different way using reflectors, using converging reflectors. That's uh, our lecture for next week. Uh, we will also have uh, uh, just one lecture devoted just to computer simulation. So computer simulation also comes on the list. It is not in the textbook, but we are going to do here three hours just of computer simulation. So you see how these things work.